five months. Good day, good evening. I'm Gina Baldo coming from Medtronic in Connecticut, United States. Welcome to the Medtronic and IBC webinar on robo laparoscopic bariatric surgery, balancing robotic precision with the security of laparoscopic smart stapling with Signia. Today is World Obesity Day and we will spend this week creating awareness and education around obesity surgery. I can't think of a better way to kick off Obesity Week, but with this fun-packed webinar and stellar faculty. I'd like to give a special thanks to Professor Harris Kawaja and his associates at IBC for all of the prep and coordination. For those of you who might not know him, Professor Harris Kwaja is a leader in program development and execution for the IBC channel. It's been a privilege and an honor to work with him. Next, I will introduce our fearless leader and moderator, Professor Andre Teixeira from United States. He is Vice Chair of General Surgery, Director of Bariatric Endoscopy, and the Director of the Bariatric Surgery Fellowship at Orlando Health in Florida. Professor Teixeira has been an inspiration and mentor to me and my team regarding the concepts for this webinar, and I'm grateful for his contributions. Not only is he a phenomenal laparoscopic surgeon, but he's also a pioneer in robotic surgery, and he's left-handed. And his fellowship directors, Drs. Rosenthal and Shamstein, got him a left-handed needle driver during his fellowship where they were wondering if you had one made for the robot as well, Dr. Teixeira. <laughs> so you can let us know about that later. But without further ado and teasing, I give you Professor Andre Teixeira. Thank you, Gina, for a wonderful introduction. And it's been a pleasure to participate in this and be among um, many, many friends here. Before we started, we were all having fun and enjoyed. Now it's time for some serious work. I have the honor and the pleasure to introduce three of my good friends here. Dr. Ben Clapp. Dr. Ben Clapp is a general MIS bariatric attending surgeon and chief of surgery in Providence Hospital in El Paso, Texas. He's associate clinical professor of surgery Texas Tech Paul Foster School of Medicine. is the president of Texas chapter of the SNBS and chair of the research community. Then we have Dr. Mohit Bandagi, a very close friend. Thank you, Mohit, for being up so early. I know it's so early over there in India. He's director of IHCAD India and director of Mohawk Bariatrics and Robotics in Indoor India. Associate professor, Department of Surgical Gastroenterology at City. Auru Bindo Medical College and Postgraduate Institute in Indore, India. Second to last, most famous, one of the famous ones has been also pioneer in robotics that we learned a lot. Actually, believe it or not, I interviewed for him for fellowship, but he did not choose me. <laughs> so Professor Santiago Hogan, the Professor in Chief of Minimum Invasive Surgery and Vice Chair of Business Development at the University of California, San Diego Health, USA. He's a director of Metabolic and Bariatric Institute and director of Center for the Future of Surgery, University of California, San Diego. He's a director of Center for the Future of Surgery, International Institute of Metabolic Medicine in Baja, California, Mexico. Dr. Clapp. Thank you. And thanks for having me here. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our first uh, speaker today. Dr. Margaret Inman from the United States, who will give a lecture entitled Bridging Laparoscopic Smart Stapling with Surgical Science. Dr. Margaret Inman is a co-founder of Ascension St. Vincent Carmel Bariatric Surgery Program in Carmel, Indiana, which is the largest program in the Ascension Health Center or system. And she's experienced in laparoscopic and robotic bariatric surgery, including the room wide gastric bypass due to switches and robotic procedures. Dr. Inman? Thank you. 
All right. All right. Well, thank you for this invitation. I am going to uh, talk about stapling science and why I've persisted in using the hybrid um, um, why I persisted in using the hybrid approach uh, for my procedures. Hmm. I, can you guys still hear me? Because it says my Zoom crashed. Are you guys okay? We can hear you. Try again, try again to uh, upload your, your, your lecture. And unmute yourself. Unmute. Okay. Now, can you guys hear me? Yes. Much better. Okay. So, sorry about that. So, again, um, I have persisted with the hybrid approach based on my understanding of stapling science, and I'm going to go through that with you today. Oh my gosh. Okay. Maybe we can move. Well, I can can you still see me? No. Shoot. Technical difficulties again. That's okay. Take take your time. Well, you can you hear us? To the next can you hear slide. us? I can see you. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, we can see you. Go ahead. Go to the okay. next slide. Okay. Let's see if you move this, change the slides, if you help. Okay. There we go. All right, so there here's my uh, disclosure slide. I am a, a consultant for Medtronic. So the objectives for my talk, a brief history of surgical staplers, the science of stapling and the science of tri-staple, uh, the advantages of tri-staple with Signia, and uh, I hopefully I'll have time to talk a little bit about robotic platform and hybrid surgery. So let's start with uh, the history. So, you know, staplers go back to the 1800s. Uh, and then in the early 1900s, so there were some attempts. But after World War II, uh, Russia had a shortage of surgeons and they started an institute to try to develop staples quickly so that the surgeons that were available could uh, work more efficiently in order to be able to perform surgeries. And kudos. So, so then Dr. Mark Ravitch from the United States went over to Russia and uh, took some of their information and technology and brought it back to the United States. And kudos to Medtronic, which was the US Surgical Corporation um, that uh, was the first in the United States to really be uh, a company that embraced the technology and advanced the technology. And their competitive J&J &J actually uh, didn't jump on board. Uh, I'm sorry, Medtronic was in the 1960s and, and their competitor didn't jump on board to the 1970s. So uh, let's talk about surgical staplers. Well, it allows for secure approximation of the tissue with hemostasis and tissue perfusion and limiting trauma. And when you look at staple formation or staple shape, the B shape is actually the optimal shape for tissue perfusion. And all, obviously the ultimate goal is to cons uh, consistently have secure tissue and avoid the catastrophic con uh, consequences of staple line leaks. So when you look at the uh, literature for bariatric surgery, uh, leaks can go from like 0.1 to 6% with ruse and 0.7 to 3% with sleeves. And I guess I would argue that um, sleeves, the consequences of sleeve leak are much more significant. So let's look at some other facts. What are, what are the two types of leaks that we see? Mechanical defects, which occurs in 48 hours or less, or ischemic uh, breakdown, which is in five to seven days. In both cases, intraluminal pressure exceeds the strength of the tissue. So obviously uh, for ischemia, blood flow to the staple line is of utmost importance. Staple cartridge options are designed for different thicknesses uh, to ensure hemostasis and tissue apposition while avoiding significant ischemia. So it was a really nice article published in 2004 by some surgeons, uh, including Baker uh, et al. And they uh, had a, a leak rate that they wanted to decrease. So they went to the lab and they did porcine studies and they looked at the dynamics of stapling um, in relation to security and prevention of leaks. Um, 
So um, re in that study, uh, they did show that uh, reinforced uh, staple lines were actually stronger uh, and buttressing on one side was actually stronger uh, than buttressing on both sides with the buttress on the anvil side being the strongest, which is actually what I personally do today. So uh, just to let you know that, although you don't appreciate this, the industry standard for optimal pressure in order to uh, look at compression is uh, eight grams per millimeter squared. For the esophagus, it's six grams per millimeter squared. And another uh, piece of information I think is important to understand is that the stomach thickness varies from 0.3 to 3.73 millimeters. So when you look at tri-staple, uh, you know that you have more variation to incorporate all those thicknesses. So um, I guess what I would say is when you're looking at surgeries, the location of almost all the surgical leaks that are clinically significant are on the stomach. I mean, I haven't ever had a leak at the anorostomy and I bet all of you would say the same. Oh, sorry about that. All right. So now let's look at uh, uh, Signia adaptive firing with tristable technology, compression and blood supply. So um, the compression widens the range of tissue applications and addresses greater availability and tissue thickness. The power delivery with instantaneous feedback controls the rate of firing and ensures adequate optimal B formation and avoids excess compression. So the issue here is time. Time is what is needed to, to create the perfect compression. And I don't know about the rest of the surgeons on the, the call or the video chat, but um, I am not a patient person. And I would say that before I had Signia and um, try staple, I would just kind of barrel through. And when you do that, you don't get good compression and good firing. So this instrumentation allows for you to accomplish that. And you don't have to think about it. It tells you in a way smarter manner than what you can do on your own. Now, the other thing about the gradation and staples is that um, it has been shown in animal studies that you have less ischemia with tri-staple. So uh, a nice study published in uh, 2018 took a standard, uh, took a, a rat model and took uh, rat stomachs and did sleeves. Uh, they used a white load uh, at, um, comparing the competitor's load and compared it to a tan load. And what they did was they did the sleeve and they assessed blood flow through the staple line. Uh, and they use this uh, microcomputer tomography and they proved that you have better blood flow with uh, the tri-staple technology. I think that's um, pretty impressive. So some other information about staple science, full thickness over sewing of staple lines significantly weaken staple lines in the porcine model. I'm not a staple line over sewer per se. I do pex the omentum to, in a loose way to the on sleeves. Um, and this is more significant in a high pressure area. Picking appropriate staple line obviously is important. Green and uh, blue staple lines were stronger with reinforcement. Green staple lines were the strongest uh, on the stomach uh, than blue on porcine stomachs. So the authors of this 2004 paper, so they went back and they slowed way down on the rate at which they fired staples to ensure good staple height. And they picked appropriate staple heights. And that translated into them uh, decreasing their leak weight from 1% to 0.3%. In my uh, experience, I haven't had a sleeve leak in probably four to five years. And that's kind of when I adapted to try staple. Um, so my rate, over the past four to five years is zero. And I think it's from the adaptive feedback that I get and selecting tri-staple uh, physiology for good perfusion. Okay, so staple line leaks. You know, 1.1% doesn't sound like a lot, but that's a patient that could leak and die because the biggest cause of death after staple line leaks is sepsis. So saving one life, and preventing one lawsuit is the most important thing when you're thinking about these. 
So in order to decrease the rate of leaks, bleeding, and ischemia, you have to have secure pressures of the tissue with acceptable birth strength, good blood flow dynamics to the edge of the stable line, and good hemostasis. So currently on the market, tristaple insignia is the only device that actually provides this type of stapling. And again, does this translate into a clinical difference? Well, for it did for me. And again, going back to those authors that we talked about, they decreased their uh, leak rate without tristaple just by slowing down, allowing for good staple formation and decreasing ischemia. So these are my references. And I think I do have some time just to talk a little bit about hybrid approach and robotics. This information was supplied by Intuitive. So uh, currently about 600,000 robotic assisted surgical procedures are performed in the United States last year and the robotic surgery market is expected to grow and approach 1 million procedures by 2028. So why use the robotic platform? Well, it is expensive, but it allows a limitless strength. I can do cases that I normally couldn't do uh, laparoscopically with higher BMI patients. There's three-dimensional visualization, there's better ergonomics for hands-on anastomosis, However, again, the cost differential can be significant. So, so what are some advantages to the hybrid approach? Well, uh, the stapling technology, and again, I'm a firm believer in that, superior blood supply, attempts to different tissue thicknesses, reload capability. Uh, the stapler accepts any load length, maximum loads per device is 12 for the robotic stapler. And uh, for the um, Signy, it's much higher. I think you go up to 20. Um, and this is key for revisions or a long stomach. Um, and also when you have an assistant, then you have two arms to align the tissue to perform or to, to uh, perform the staple. Um, some other things, you have a bedside assistant in case of an emergency, difficult expo exposure allows extra readily mobile arm and hand. You know, there is a delay, although it's, uh, just microseconds, but if there's a bleeder, I have an assistant to grab that quicker than I can grab it. Bedside feedback, I think that's the most important thing. When we're doing a sleeve, if I put a, a purple load on and it's, when I compress and it's too thick, I can back off and use a black load. Flexibility and options for reinforcement. I'm a firm believer in only reinforcing on one side. Uh, flexibility and cartridge lengths. Uh, a broader range of tissue thickness. Again, I think this is some of the most important things. Uh, versatility and platform usage. I can go from one robot to the next to laparoscopic and I'm not using, I'm not compromising on my selection of equipment. Um, I have an assistant to have suction and application of sealants, the second set of eyes. Um, my assistant has tactile sensation. Sometimes I'm looking and I say, oh, is that a blood vessel? Is that a lymph node? I can't tell with a robot. Well, visually I can, but sometimes things are a little bit difficult. In extremely difficult cases, a second assistant can add a trocar if we need to, that's rare, but I have that option. So uh, do we have time for me to show a quick uh, video on robotic, my hybrid technique for robotic, or otherwise I'll stop? Go for it. Okay, so um, I do really long limb lengths. I take it to the limit. So I do start laparoscopically. I found it was difficult and the robotic arms are a little less gentle than um, uh, my hands. So I do start and just measure things out. And I dock the robot. I do 150-150, iliopancreatic and root. All right, so now the robot's docked. Uh, we're going to uh, divide the momentum. And then I'm, uh, I try to do a sparing of the nerves. Uh, and so we're getting into the lesser sac there. And here my assistant's coming in with a tri-staple purple load. And you'll see that I have, I'm using my um, reinforcements uh, artistically here. What I'm using for reinforcement here for is so that I don't touch the tissue uh, when I'm manipulating, I'm actually touching the reinforcement. Because I feel like in particular with the robot, again, less tactile sensation, I think there's more risk for tissue damage with grasping. So uh, here is my anastomosis. I do a two uh, layer hand sew. The outer layer is absorbable three uh, V-lock 90. 
And I used to do 180, but I found when I would do post-op uh, endoscopies, I, I saw too much suture too far out. So the outer layer is the VLOC 90, so it's gone in 90 days. The inner layer is uh, 3 ovicrol. And I uh, did the Vicryl. I used to do two VLOC 90s, but I went to Vicryl again when I was doing endoscopies and I, I want to dilate. I, I, I just don't want to see that much suture. So here is my inner layer, which is the Vicryl. And um, I will... Um, I do gauge this. I do put at the end, I put a, like a 32 to a 34 bougie through just to make sure that it's patent and also that I'm right at that oh, 10 to 11 to 12 millimeter uh, size and estimosis. So then I just test with glue. Um, and then I, uh, I know Phil Shower does this, but uh, I had a fellow from Peru Luciano Poggi and, and we uh, developed this. We, I, we do something called a, a bufanda. So here I'm gonna mobilize some momentum and I'm gonna wrap it around. And I did this for a couple of reasons. One, it's probably saved me when I've done uh, endoscopies and I've been a little aggressive. And I also know that there's pluripotential cells in the omentum. And I think that that can impact uh, healing and, and tissue, um, I know security, um, I'm a firm believer the amenum does a lot of things we don't know. So here is the enterinerostomy and I use a, a tan load. I do not uh, buttress here. I do have a partner that buttresses with this. Um, we go, so it's uh, two staple loads. Uh, and there we finish and I do close my spaces with permanent VLOC. And these I usually can do in about an hour and 15 minutes, sometimes less. So I've not had an anastomotic leak here. I will tell you on my first have a robotic roux, um, I did have a tear in the distal stomach and the stomach distended and I had to take the patient back, not for a leak at the uh, enterinerostomy, but a leak in a hole, a little tiny little hole, millimeter hole in the distal stomach. So I'm extremely careful uh, in my dissection. And that should be it. I do have a, a, a hybrid sleeve, but I think I'm probably out of time. Thank you very much, Dr. Amen. Amazing presentation. Um, now we're gonna ask a couple of questions. Myself, Dr. Klatt, Dr. Van Dyke, Dr. Hogan. So the question I have, and it probably everybody has the same question. So I've done many, many cases with, um, um, assistant bedside stapling when during SI. And in 2018, in 2018, I changed to uh, fully stapler. So my assistant has been with me for the past 12 years. If you don't have an assistant that's been with you every day, like you said, a second eye that you trust, how do you feel about them firing the stapler? I think that's the question that everybody's going to have, right? That's question number one. Okay. Question number two. Question number two. If currently all the platforms that you had had their own stapling to it, okay, would you still use the bedside stapling? I am not willing to give up uh try staple technology and uh the feedback that i get now if if no if hugo had a, had their own hugo had their own oh as long as it's tri staple yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 perfect yeah absolutely i would i would because i i again i i've researched the science i'm totally convinced based on what i've read that you know tri staples is way better than one size stapler there's better blood flow slowing down and having adaptive technology is going to give you the best formation. You know, I know when I did green loans on my own, I wasn't doing that. So, so the answer was if Hugo has the same thing, absolutely. So I would do that. 
but I, I obviously think it, uh, the other company, the robotic company currently is never going to do that. So I'm never going to give up that part of it. So as far as the assistant goes, you know, um, I agree with you to a certain extent, but I remember when I was a surgery resident, uh, one of the surgeons said, you know, a monkey can do surgery. It's just taking care of the patient and, and knowing things. So I guess what I would suggest is have a second surgeon there that can fire staplers, whether a general surgeon. I mean, there's tons of surgeons that know how to fire staplers, right? There's not, I mean, and even if you're at a place where you're the only bariatric surgeon, you can get a surgeon to come in and fire a stapler. You still have that control. Um, you know, the other thing I would suggest is that you get an assistant um, to learn that first, you know, to learn how to fire a stapler first, because I can really, you know, I can really adjust tissues and get everything where I need them to be. It might take me a little longer without a first assistant, but um, I think a first assistant is, um, you know, for that, the most important thing is to start with the staple loads. Then I have two assistants, but, you know, I have used a partner. You can use a surgery resident. Um, frankly, I, you could use someone in another specialty. Um, you know, um, I know in some small communities, family medicine doctors do, uh, help surgeons. Um, and so that would be an option as well. I have used the intuitive stapler and I just on several cases and I had bleeding. I didn't feel the tissue was aligned as well. Uh, and again, does it translate into clinical significance in the broad sense? And my argument is it probably saves one leak in a thousand, but that could be a death. And, and to me, I want zero leaks. And so to me, it makes a difference. Okay, okay, so question, uh, how important is buttressing with Signia compared to without? Um, that's a very good question. I think I'm more comfortable with buttressing with Signia, although I have always buttressed the way I currently do. I have not changed my technique at all, laparoscopic to robotic. Um, but I would say that Signia would give you more feedback. So let's say you're buttressing with a purple and you're on the first load on a sleeve, in the antrum and it tells you it's too thick, I think you have two options. Take it out, buttress a black, or take the buttressing off the purple and see if you get a better feedback. So I've got a question. Um, you know, we released the numbers for the ASMBS um, in the, for 2022 and about 30% of bariatric surgery is done robotically, but of course the database doesn't have the capability of picking out what stapler is used so what do you think is the percentage of people that are doing this hybrid approach? Because that, that's like Andrea pointed out, that's how we did them before. We had the XI. Um, so what do you think it is now? Oh, I don't, I think I'm not in the majority and I feel bad about that. Um, I, I, I strongly feel that um, there are surgeons out there that aren't using it that should, because I think their complication rate would be less. Um, and if you look at the literature, you look at the, the variation in leak rate, you know, someone's having a leak rate of 3% and someone has a leak rate of 0.1%. Well, what is the cause of that? Well, staple line formation, right? You know, blood flow. So what is the difference there? The difference is how you're using the stapler. So, and I think I have another question. Um, uh, Andres, can I, Andre, can sure. I make a comment on a, uh, on a question? That, that was an excellent lecture. And, you know, what I remember doing the first gastric bypass in 2000, and we use a, a, the robot to do the anastomosis like you did, and then we use the regular staplers. And, and I think that Gina has the right answer for that because Hugo is going to give you the real stapler and, and that's going to be the benefit of, 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 of Hugo Robert, right? Um, to what Ben was saying, we, we just got the paper accepted uh, at ASMBS for, for podium presentation. When we look at 600,000 uh, bariatric robotic surgeries done, and we saw higher complication rate when the robot is used compared to laparoscopy. As this is 600,000 cases out of the database, the, the MSMBS. So, so I think that we're going to see a lot of things coming now that we have huge numbers uh, and, and put uh, the title of our abstract is press the brakes. It's time to look at the data, right? Uh, uh, so, 
I think that that that's that's going to change. Um, so so what you are saying about the the tri-stepper is 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 correct. And and uh, Margaret, it, they, there is a question from from the audience. So what what color staplers do you use for your sleep gastrectomy? Uh, I am not uh, uh, in favor of downsizing. So I use black to start. And then uh, after the first load, what I do is I ask my assistant what we're, what zones we're in. If we're in three on a black for the first firing, I use a second black. If we're in one on the first firing, then I use a purple. I do not use uh, reinforcement routinely on sleeves. Um, I use reinforcement on ruse in, in, in certain areas, mostly because I think it adds strength and it's easier to sew to. Um, but I would start with black. And I will tell you that I did for a while switch because you can downsize a trocar, I switched to purple. And I saw a lot of fracture of the serosa. And so I had to do a lot more over sewing. And I said, you know, this isn't worth it. Three millimeters isn't worth it. I I'm going to go back to blacks. Now, I didn't have a leak when I did that. But again, I was over sewing a lot. And that's not the right thing to do. The right thing to do is pick the right staple height. Dr. Eamon, thank you very much for your presentation. Fantastic. But because of time, we have to move for the next sure. presentation. Absolutely. Okay, so it's a it's a true pleasure and honor for for me to introduce a, a great friend. Uh, I am I'm going to be biased in the presentation because uh, he's a close friend of mine. Uh, but but uh, Professor Diego Camacho, he's a associate professor of surgery at Albert Einstein College of Medicine at Montefiore Medical Center. He's also the director of uh, minimal invasive surgery and endoscopic surgery. He's an incredible talent in surgeon. I have seen many surgeons around. I don't think I have seen many like uh, Diego. He's a, he's a true, true leader and, 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 and an innovator. So look forward to his lecture. Um, and he's, he's going to be talking about techniques, tricks, and traps of hybrid stapling in bariatric surgery, challenging a little bit Dr. Rinman, but he's also a... Um, going to be talking with Mr. Stellin Johnson, who is a surgical physician assistant at Montefiore, who doesn't have much experience, only 12,000 cases where he has been involved with, so huge experience also from Stellin. So we, we really look forward to, to this presentation and, and, and to see what, what we can learn from this team that is very accomplished and with a lot of experience. Well, thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> Santi, for those uh, kind words. Um, I would like to uh, take one minute to thank Gina Baldo, Medtronic, Harris, and the great uh, panel of professors uh, that is uh, speaking with me today. Um, when they ask me about this talk, I think that it's uh, not only the surgical part, as Dr. Inman said before, I think uh, <clears throat> that we also need a good assistant. And I think that that's why I invited my uh, physician assistant, Stellan Johnson, who has uh, tons of experience, over 12,000 cases here at Montefiore. And um, so it's an honor to be here. And let's see if you can enjoy this talk. So let's, uh, uh, these are my disclosures. I think, uh, you know, as you can see, I'm a Medtronic consultant. Uh, but I'm going to tell you that I am a late adopter of uh, robotic surgery, even though I trained in the 2000s with uh, robotic surgery at the Ohio State University, uh, but for some reason uh, it took me some time to uh, to get in the wagon and, and move forward with this. So over the past two years, I've been performing uh, robotic surgery, bariatric surgery, and hernias especially. So uh, three months ago, uh, we had a minor issues with the stapling from uh, the robotic platforms, and I was talking to Stellan, and I said, "How can we change this?" and we you know, he said to me, I just took a course uh, in Connecticut and I saw a surgeon doing a hybrid approach of uh, the tri-stapler. And that's the stapler that I have been using for the past, I will say, 12, 15 years and the Signy as well. So I feel very comfortable and I said, let's go ahead and do it. Um, so we did our first case and then, uh, you know, it, it went very well. It was very easy to perform. So this talk is not 
for me to try to convince you that, uh, you know, that uh, robotic or laparoscopic or hybrid is better. This is another way to do things. So um, knowing that Dr. Santiago Jorgen and Andre Teixeira, two big uh, robotic professors uh, are here, I have a little video um, for you guys. <clears throat> so wait, Stella. Um, when uh, they asked me to give the presentation, I thought, well, you know, uh, I remember five years, uh, three years ago when the intuitive reps came to me and said, like, why don't we start doing bariatric surgery uh, and we're going <clears> to <throat> have this, our staplers and they're going to take over. So oh, now you can start selling. So uh, I said, OK, let's see how we're going to happen. This it. is how I think for the next three, four years, you know, watching robotic surgery and the stapling is doing a big difference. And me in the corner, you know, uh, feeling very safe with the right paper. Uh, but then suddenly I knew that there was a way to come back. This is uh, how we approach the hybrid, you know? How can we keep using our technology to try safe or to cover safe uh, to have the same results as Dr. Inman was saying, that, you know, less bleeding, less liquids, uh, and still, you know, we were able to use the hybrid to offer the same uh, safety to our patients. Uh, and three months ago, this is how we did it. You know? We did it back, now we're back. Uh, uh, and I think that it's going to be great when Cuba comes out and definitely talk about you know, how to use robotic surgery and the platform of tri staper technique. So, uh, next. <laughs> so, why hybrid approach? So, um, next, uh, Stalita. So first of all, we are always talking about data. Show me the data. Where is the data? Dr. Santi Horgan is saying, it's time to show the data. And we keep seeing many papers, but I couldn't find any paper that talks and compares uh, the stapling from uh, robotic platforms and the Medtronic or Johnson & Johnson. They talk about uh, results, long-term results, acute complications. Um, <clears throat> and in many procedures, sleep gastrectomies, revisions, uh, gastric bypasses. So we all, you know, and if you look at the conclusions uh, at the end of all these papers, I think that, you know, is this is true, you know, higher OR times? I think that the times have been decreasing tremendously, even in my uh, short experience of two years, uh, where I do 25, 30% of my practice with robotic. Is it higher cost? Definitely, there has to be a little bit of higher cost. Um, no pain difference, and this was proven uh, by an article that was published in uh, Medical College of Wisconsin just recently. Uh, no difference in length of stay and the complications, as Dr. Texier is saying, you know, there are many uh, good papers out there that are talking about decreasing the, the complication rate to almost comparable to laparoscopic surgery. So I think that time has evolved. I think that we're seeing uh, new platforms and uh, with great results. But again, I think that if you feel comfortable using your staplers and you have great results over the years, I think that this is another way to do it. So uh, go ahead. So uh, I'm just gonna touch a little bit about the cost because people get a little surprised about cost and cost and why is it cost? Um, I'm not gonna give you the number of uh, uh, Medtronic contracts because every institution has different contracts but we know and we have standardized prices for um, <clears throat> robotic platforms that you can see without reinforcement, uh, we have at least um, and, you know, some uh, cost savings in the reinforced and non-reinforced staplers uh, of almost $217 with the non-reinforced staplers. And with the reinforced staplers, we have a cost of uh, $323 per case. Uh, my institution performs around 1,200 cases per year. Not all of them are sleeves, but we do around 700 sleeve gastrectomies. So as you can tell, we have a big difference and we can save a lot of money to institution. This is just a 200 uh, uh, case uh, per year scenario where you can see that we can save around $5,500 uh, with, uh, with reinforcement. So <clears throat> keep going, Stalit. So um, I'm not going to touch... I'm not going to talk a lot about the stapling uh, because Dr. Inman already uh, gave us a great presentation. 
And um, but I remember when I started using the Endo GIA, and then we went to the iDrive. Was a little bulky, and I was you know part of the, the uh, KOL uh, that helped developing the the power stapler. And now we have this great uh, you know power stapler Signia, who uh, is light, is uh, is very you know good, gives us good feedback. Uh, change seven. Good thick, but uh, as Dr. Inman said, like thickness tissue, uh, uh, compression status, and it will stop us if we don't, if we cannot fire. So we are seeing in real time all these benefits that the same as uh, the robotic platforms can give you. But this is a different way because the staple portion, I think, is what I'm looking for, and this is the part that I definitely uh, want to talk about. So. Uh, by uh, finishing my part of the talk, I think that uh, the next slide uh, is gonna, the next part of the presentation is gonna be given by Dr. Stel uh, Mr. Stellan Johnson, who is my assistant, uh, physician assistant in the operating room. I have worked with him for the past 15 years. He have worked with so many surgeons, bariatric surgeons that are well known. So uh, it's an honor to, you know, introduce uh, uh, Stellan to the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Camacho, and um, thank you to the IBC and Medtronic for uh, inviting me, and it's really an honor for me to be able to present to uh, such, a, such a prestigious uh, group today. Uh, so as a PA, a first assist, I'm going to talk a little bit from my angle, how um, things work, and some tips as well. So tips in terms of the hybrid approach. So as we heard from Dr. Inman, Dr. Camacho, this technique may not be for everyone, right? So you need a dedicated first assist, whether it's a PA, a resident, or fellow. And you need someone who's going to be there consistently, right? Someone consistent enough to learn your technique, learn how to use a stapler, um, and really someone that's detail-oriented and is able to follow instructions well. Uh, patience is a key. Um, so... We all know surgeons are known for one thing. If they're known for one thing, it's no, they're known for patients. Uh, either they have it or they don't. So um, this takes time to train a, a, a first assist, whether whoever it might be, right? So you're going to have to take time to teach them how to use the stapler. The stapler is very ergonomic. Uh, in my experience, it's very easy to use. Um, and it's very intuitive as well. And um, I think it's a very short learning curve in terms of that. I think um, what takes a little bit longer is really learning the specifics uh, technique and uh, the specifications for each surgeon. So the first assist should be an extension of the surgeon. Um, and what I mean by that is you should be able to trust the first assist at the bedside to be able to do it as if you were bedside as well, exactly how you would do it. Uh, if I give you a scenario, there may be times when you're operating where you open the stapler and you make, might make an adjustment and you close it. To everyone else in the room, it looks exactly, it looks like you close it in the exact same spot. But to you as a surgeon, that little micrometer of a difference uh, is really critical in terms of the success of the surgery um, and the anatomy. So in that same way, you should be able to feel comfortable with whoever you have bedside to be able to uh, convey that and to be able to see those key differences. Lots of communication is key as well. So here we see a slide where um, you just wanna be clear in terms of how we are directing uh, from the console. Uh, there's, a, there's many uh, commands here that we can use. And you just wanna be very specific, right? In terms of even uh, in concern, in relation to the anatomy. So in relation to the bougie, uh, go tighter or looser uh, by the esophagus, the lesser curve by the fundus when you get up to the um, left cruise. Right, so every surgeon has different spe uh, specificities that they like. Some people go tight along the, the top of the, the sleeve. Some people like it a little bit loose, okay? So we just wanna be very specific in terms of how we communicate that. Uh, just really quickly, some traps and pitfalls that you might fall into. Um, so loud music or distractions in the OR, right? So, you know, we all like a little bit of music in the OR. Um, you know, Dr. Camacho is a bit of a Swifty. He likes a little bit of uh, Taylor Swift, but that stays within here. Okay. So, but we don't want to go too loud. Right. So as long as it doesn't interfere with you communicating between the console and the bedside, 
um, then it's not a problem, right? So you just want to have that closed loop communication. Um, the other pitfall could be surgeon frustration, right? So if if we have that poor communication, right? Or inadequate training, right? So they don't go through the process, right? So we learn a lot of times, see one, do one, teach one, right? So it's, it's not the case with this, right? It takes some time really to really learn the stapler, learn how to maneuver the stapler. Um, and then really, I think more importantly is really learning each surgeon's specific needs for each operation, right? So you have to learn that, really analyze it, you got to be detail oriented with it, right? In terms of exactly how the surgeon wants, which is critical. Okay. Um, and like I said, the first assist may not be familiar, right? So that can be a pitfall as well. So here we're going to talk a little bit about the port sites. So when we initially saw this technique being done, they, we, were, we saw they were using five troll cars in total. Uh, so they had four robotic and then one um, stapler or a, a assist port. So we were able to eliminate that extra eight millimeter. And then what we did was we just put uh, a 15 here in the right side and we piggybacked it with the eight millimeter trocar, which you can see over here. Okay. And you'll see in the video coming up. So here you can see, you can clearly see over here, we have the 15 millimeter trocar and we have the eight millimeter robotic trocar as well. Uh, and some might say that the robotic, uh, the center might be off. Uh, but that's okay. It hasn't affected us in terms of doing the surgery as well. Uh, we've been able to do it uh, without any problem as well. And we've done this with a, a good amount of, of variance in terms of BMI with lower BMIs uh, in their 40s and uh, going up to the 60s as well. So we've done the dissection at this point. And then I've undocked. And you can see I got plenty of space to, space to work as the assist. And we're getting going easily unobstructed, no limitations really. And really what I'm doing is listening to the surgeon at the console, right? Dr. Quanta, what is he telling me? He's helping me adjust. So typically we go about four to six, four to six centimeters from the pylorus and we advance the bougie first, which is advanced over here. And once he's ready, then we fire, right? And we don't fire until he's absolutely sure, absolutely perfect, right? Once we fire, there's no turning back. So it's also key in terms of just communicating very clearly when to fire. Okay, so typically what we'll do for our sleeves is we use about two black 60 reinforced as well as two purple 60 reinforced. And then the, the fifth stapler will depend. So in this case, um, you'll be able to see that after the fourth staple line, there's just a little bit left, right? So. Um, we actually have that flexibility to switch to a, a 45, which uh, is a benefit compared if you compare it to the robotic platform where you are really locked into that 60 short form where you don't have the option to really go back and forth. So that flexibility really helps us. Um, and it, it's also a cost benefit as well in terms of saving money from that end. Okay, and you can see the staple lines are nice and clean, right? And really, Again, this is exactly how Dr. Macho is, if he was bedside, he's gotta be completely happy with it as you see over here, okay? So as you can see here, we're gonna have one, this is the fourth fire. Okay, so you can see over there, everything's going well, right? So if there's ever a question about the thickness, right? We always give back feedback from the screen. It will give us feedback and tell us how thick if we're not sure. Um, and we can, even before firing, you can close it get a read on the thickness. If you're not sure, you can adjust the stapler as needed. Okay, so um, we have that flexibility and that, really that comfort in knowing that, you know, you're really using that adaptive fire technology and that tri-staple technology to really give us that real-time feedback that we get. Okay, so in conclusion, um, you know, the hybrid approach is a safe and effective option where we can utilize the benefits of the robotic platform, right? So we're still using the benefits of the robot, right? There's no denying that the robot is um, upcoming and it's growing, it's a growing field. So we're still able to do the training on the robot as well, even with our residents and fellows, uh, but also we can merge the trusted laparoscopic technology, right? With the Signia stapler. So we have that option as well. So it gives us that comfort in knowing that. Like most things, the hybrid bedside stapling takes time and training. It's very rewarding and it's got excellent outcomes uh, as we've had for years with that stapler, with that Cygnus stapler, 
as well as OR team satisfaction, it actually increases uh, engagement with the, within the team. So there's a little bit more OR team satisfaction as well. Thank you. I, I have to say that I'm not a Swifter. I am a believer. I'm a Justin Bieber believer, <laughs> not a, okay, just for you guys to know. <laughs> Listen, I was going to ask you my question to you, call you Dr. Swifter. <laughs> no, I'm a believer. I'm a believer. Listen, great, great presentation. Great teamwork, right? As you can see, both of you guys have been working together for many, many years. And that goes back to the first lecture, right? I've been on that boat. My, my sister with me for 10 years, know exactly how I want to do it. Less talk, just everything done. Uh, but not everybody has that, right? But at that point to our side, I have two questions for both of you. One is, Camacho, I always, when I did my bad size tape back in the days, um, I always arrow on the bigger side, meaning a little bit bigger sleeve, a little bit bigger bypass, because I, I didn't have a full visualization or, or should I say a feel for it or how tight I was to the tube or not. How do you compensate for that? Okay, because... People talk about you don't have a tactile sensation. You don't have a feel for it. That is not true. After 3,000 robotic cases, I can feel anything I want inside of that robot with, uh, with picking up things and so forth. So you develop a visualization tactile perspective, right? So that is how you approach that. Number two is you talk about cost. You have to play devil's advocate because we have to compare cost to cost everything. I don't know if it's true or not, but let me ask you this. Do you think majority of the people they use handheld staplers, do they buttress? And if they do, that should be included in your cost also, correct? Yes, so that is correct. I think, I think you have to always compare with, uh, yeah. when you he, Helmet talk about this, this is my thing, you should always compare apples to apples, right? To be able to make sense, right? That's Those are my two questions. I, I, that's what I had the comparison of the stapler with and without. So there are two slides, one with and without, uh, for the people that like to use uh, buttress and the ones that mm -hmm. don't like to use buttress. Uh, I'm going to give you a little example. One of my partners that does not like to use buttress material, he likes to, one of them, Dr. Choi, likes to oversaw the staple line with a V-lock, and the other one likes to put, you know, uh, surgery. Uh, Tessial and, you know, little extra fiber and glues and things like that. So that it's adding extra cost. But yeah, I have the mm -hmm. comparison of both with and without buttress material. How many surgeons are using, uh, you know, buttress versus known buttress? I think that most yeah. of the people that I know are using buttress material right now. Uh, so let's say 50-50. Let's play 50-50. So I think that um, if you want to add now, I have seen videos that when you use the buttress material in the robotic platform, sometimes the, 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 the robot does not recognize the thickness because you are taking this, the sensation of the, 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 the power of the, the, the compression on the tip of the, the stapler. I have seen, I saw a video that went very bad, uh, but you know, things happen and things happen with the, our staplers as well and we have to fix it. Uh, so, yeah, comparison is there. You can see the numbers. I think that the numbers speak by, by themselves, but it depends what contracts you have with the company. That's one mm -hmm. question. In regards to the other one, we use the VCG, so we put the, the, the bougie on suction, so we can pretty much, as you can see, after four or 5,000 sleeves, you know how close you are with the stapler. Uh, you know that the, the VCG is already on suction. So... I think that that has been a very easy transition for us uh, not to compromise the, the, the wide uh, sleeve or if we are not too close to the, the, the antrum, things like that. So, you know, it's, it comes with experience, as Stellan is saying. Um, but I think that it, it's very doable. It's very easy to perform and it doesn't add time. Um, and on the other hand, I feel very comfortable and happy with the, the way that the, the staple formation. And just to add to what you mentioned about having a skilled PA, first assist or a PA, um, 
I do agree. Yes, I do have experience on my side. And I think very early on, you can tell who your first assist is if they're able to even do something like this, right? So if they're not, if you get scared when they, when you hand them a scalpel, maybe they're not the right person to uh, do this, right? So, um, you know, in general, like if they're not detail oriented, things like that, maybe, so they may not be for everyone, but I think if you find the right people, the right uh, PA there that's, that has potential to train, um, that's definitely, um, it will take time, but I think you can get there as well um, with that. So I don't think it's necessarily out of the question and I don't think you need you know, thousands and thousands of cases, you know, but I think a good amount of time to just really observe the surgeon, learn the technique, learn the intricacies for each surgeon and really how to use that stapler. And then you can go from there. Do you there a, 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 go ahead. That, that was an excellent presentation. Great videos, both of you. I, I, I have two questions for you. One is, what, what do residents feel about this hybrid approach? Uh, the, the, they like it because they, they are the future generation, right? And two is, why to use a robot? If you're using the, the stable for the most important part, are you using the robot just to take your gastrics? I like more the Liga, sure. So th those, those are the two questions. Yeah, so, you know, we don't have too many robots at Montefiore. We have four robots. So, and, and when I get a chance to use it, I can use it and do the, the sleeves or my hernias or bariatrics. So it depends if that day I'm able to access the robot. Um, on the other hand, I think that there are very challenging cases in the Bronx, you know, the BMIs. We see patients that are BMI greater than 55 most of the time. And, uh, you know, age really impacts in, in, in how you perform surgery. And, and, and I think that uh, the, the usage of uh, robotic surgery has helped, you know, in so many ways to perform this very complex, super, super obese patient. Now, in the stapling part, it's easy, you know, it's, it's as you said, the stapling, I feel comfortable firing. And I thought that we were going to have issues with the stapler reaching all the way up to the to the <clears throat> angle of it. But we didn't have any problem. So that's one. And the other question about the residents, they love it because most of the time I'm working either with the fellow or with the chief resident next to me. I'm letting them do the case. And I have, let's say, an intern in the cons in the in the bedside. And just by letting him fire the stapler and the PGY2s, they're very happy. They really, because otherwise they stay there and they just exchange one arm for another and they don't do anything. So I think that they are happy at least to have the whole team involved in, in, the, in the patient. And I think with that bedside approach with the intern there, I think it's okay, but you have to have you know, some oversight there, right? So have someone experienced by the bedside as well to help out as well in case yeah. uh, there's any issues as well. I, like, I think okay, I like, Dougie, you have a question. Uh, I like what well, you said about the health. It's very important because with a high BMI, you, you, you finish dying. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I have mm -hmm. more white hair now, Dante. <laughs> so I think there's a question on the uh, chat and they, they are, were asking about, regarding training to be a skilled PA in robotics, are there courses, observerships in the US uh, and the average learning curve? Um, so I'd say, you know, from my experience, I'd say probably about, you know, four to six weeks, but depending on the volume that you do, right? So if you do a little bit of volume, it's obvious it can take more. If you do high volume, um, probably about six weeks in terms of like being with that surgeon consistently. Um, and then as well as observerships, I'm not sure if anything is offered right now. I believe that the, that might be in the works in the future with uh, Medtronic, as well as um, courses or even fe surgical fellowships they have for PAs as well in terms of learning a little bit more in terms of operative experience. Mohit, you have a question? Yeah, before introducing uh, Hilmat, I have an interesting question. First of all, thank you, Stellin, and thank you, Dr. Diego. And thank you, Dr. Diego, to bring in Stellin inside the... Uh, this entire meeting. Uh, it reminds me about my assistant who is with me since last 14 years now. And uh, I have a very interesting question uh, uh, to both, both of you. How frustrating it is uh, for you, Dr. Diego, when you are doing a case in a live workshop and Stalin is not there to assist you. And how frustrating it is for you, Stalin, 
when you have to assist a surgeon who is not as good as Dr. Diaz? <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's like having a soccer game, you know, you need the forwards and you need the goalie. So I think that if I know that I'm not going to have the, the right team players, then I'm not going to do it like that. I'll do it laparoscopic and it's going to be easier for me. And of course, when I'm not around, Stellan cries a lot. <laughs> yes. He wants me to be there. So that's the answer for the two questions, you know. Yeah. So from my end, I think, you know, I am lucky enough to work with Dr. Camacho. He's very experienced, very skilled. And, you know, honestly, and I'm not saying this just to blow smoke or anything like that, but our surgeons are really excellent, um, the surgeons that we have. And I'm very lucky to work with all the surgeons that we have, about four surgeons now that I work with that are all excellent. The last one just came from fellowship that was trained under all of our current surgeons. So they're all kind of trained up to par as well. So I'm lucky enough from that standpoint, but yes, I'm sure there definitely is frustration when you do work with less experienced surgeons that may, <laughs> may not have that experience. So I have one more question before we jump to the next talk. So Camacho, <laughs> for you, first of yeah. all, you can fix your problem if you are Brazilian, right? Then you have excellent players on your soccer team. Okay, just to start there. Second, when do you choose to use the bad size stapler versus the robotic stapler? Do you have an algorithm in your head or, or you look at the special, the BMI is 90, not sure it's going to reach. How, how do you, or you or just for now on, you just do one way? I think that I started and I said to Stellan, why don't we try the low BMIs first? Of course, you want to try to do the easy <laughs> ones, the ones that don't have a big liver, not much fat. Uh, and, and, and we try to females at the beginning, you know, because the amount of fat in the upper portion especially is, is less. Uh, and then I said, why don't we go from 40 to 45, 40 to 50, 50 to 55, 50 to... So we started to increase. Now, it depends if I have access to the system that day and I don't control my, my you know, or uh, my or scheduling. So sometimes I come to work and I have five sleeves and we... If I have access to the system, I will use the system and do it uh, hybrid. And But again, if, if it's a BMI of 60 uh, or a 55 with previous surgeries, I would like to have Stellan in the room. Now, if I'm going to have an intern that has never fired a stapler, definitely that case is going to be done laparoscopic, not robotic. Hey, Andre, um, I don't know if I hear well, but, but you were talking about Brazil and the football players. <laughs> I, I, I just want to remind everybody that Argentina is the world champion. Okay, we forgot. <laughs> I knew it. I, knew I it. had to say that. <laughs> I knew it. Mohit, go for it. Yeah, yeah. okay. So uh, let's move on. Uh, it's an honor to introduce a great friend, uh, somebody I have looked up to, and uh, one of the great bariatric surgeons in this community, Helmut Billy from California. He is a bariatric surgeon and endoscopist at Venture Advanced Health Associates, Surgical Associates, and also one of the key executive members at the ASMBS. Uh, Hilmet is uh, uh, going to talk about the health economics of robotic bariatric surgery, uh, added cost and added capital, something, a topic very close to my heart also because we come from India where we have lack of these resources. So the stage is all yours, Hilmet, and we look forward to this talk. Thank you, Mohit. I'm going to share my screen. Can you see it? Yeah. All right. <laughs> so I have this topic with no video, but has uh, an important topic for all the smaller hospitals. When I was preparing for this, I phoned around to some of my colleagues and they were telling me they had 25 robots, 40 robots. Uh, they had practices which had an excellent payer mix. And I'm in a different situation here, and we have to constantly look at medical economics. Here's my disclosure slide. And this whole topic goes back a long way, back to the origins and the formation of the United States when wise people like Ben Franklin said, beware of little expenses because a small leak will sink a great ship. And we have to think about that with respect to the resources that we have provided by our hospitals and the communities that we serve. 
And uh, there's an important part of understanding how your operation and your operating room really works. And that's something known as the contribution margin. It's an economic term. We think of profit margins and we think of overhead, but the contribution margin really is ideally suited to assessing what's going on in the operating room. And if you look at it in a business sense, it's a simple definition. When you make a product or deliver a service, in our case, we're delivering an operation and deduct the variable cost. That's the cost that we can control in the operating room of delivering that product. The leftover revenue is called the contribution margin. And this is what your hospital administrators look at with respect to the fixed costs that we can also play a role in on whether your product line is one that's going to survive or one that's going to have trouble. So the aggregate amount of revenue available after the variable cost is the amount that we use to cover the fixed expenses of the company or the hospital. That would be the nurses, the antibiotics you use, the tests you order. After fixed expenses are paid, the leftover is the profit that the hospital utilizes or the company utilizes for growth and other things. And so if a product's contribution margin is negative, the company's losing money with each unit it produces. Or if the contribution margin is very low, the uh, hospital may look to see how you can increase that margin so that it remains a viable uh, uh, service line. The, the choices they have is to drop the service line, increase the prices. We really don't have much of that because we're dependent at most hospitals in the United States on, on fee for service or decrease the cost. And that's where we are the most useful. And we hear about cost, cost, cost all the time, but we don't get a very thorough assessment of it. This has been something that's very important to orthopedic surgeons. They were the first ones who really got hit with changes on the inpatient only versus outpatient only designation. And those designations change, the hospital revenues will change. And sometimes at the, and not at the best um, uh, opportunity for the patient, the ones that end up being inpatients are often the ones we talk about, more comorbidities, higher risk, Hospital is, is incurring far more cost and the revenues that they get become uh, questionable. So in this study, which was in the journal, arthro uh, uh, what's it, uh, arthroscopy or arthroscopy, an orthopedic journal, removal of uh, primary knee, total, re total knee arthroplasty and total hip arthroplasty from the inpatient only list, they looked at the financial impact for both patients and institutions. And they looked at all patients who had total knee arthroplasties and hips after the procedures were removed from the inpatient only list. In other words, it was up to the surgeon whether they got an inpatient, but they were pushed and paid to have them as outpatients. There were over 5,000 patients. This is the way they were broken up. And the per patient revenues, the total and direct costs, and finally the contribution margins were collected. And these were largely Medicare patients because that's the age that we get when we need these. The contribution margin was 89% lower for the inpatient cohort when compared to outpatient. And that reflects the higher cost of having to provide services and care for those patients. The Medicare patients receiving total hip arthroplasties inpatient status were financially disincentivized. In other words, the hospital and the surgeons started feeling that these were patients that were not going to be profitable and were, might very well cause financial distress for their institutions. Medicaid patients were the population at risk of losing access to care. So within these Medicaid or government managed plans, you can start to see why hospitals start to shy away from them. And we're only at the beginning of seeing the, the loss or the redesignation primarily in the, in the PPO or commercial payer group because CMS just looked at this and did not take away the designation of inpatient status for our uh, cases, but the contribution was 128% higher for patients receiving total hip arthroplasty and 136% higher for inpatients receiving total knee arthroplasties. But the costs, despite that being higher, overwhelmed the uh, actual contribution margin. Here, patient revenues for inpatient versus outpatient were 57% higher for Medicare, 114% higher for Medicaid and HMO managed plans. But the contribution margin was minus 17 percent. It's a negative contribution margin for inpatient, and it was a large positive contribution margin for outpatients due to the patient selection issue. Here's another study where they looked at the trends in, in revenue cost and contribution margin for total joint arthroplasty 2011 through 2021, and it 
demonstrated a significant downward trend in the contribution margin, pushing itself back towards zero or negative in Medicare and government mandated Medicaid. And the conclusion was that physician-led innovation was actually the cost-saving strategy that maintained contribution margin over the past decade. However, this is getting more and more difficult as the direct costs seen, the nursing, the pharmacy, all of the patient care issues that are sort of fixed for a hospital over the past few years could lead to these pushing negative if further efficiency and cost-saving measures are not developed. So this is essential for us to look at and understand now if we're going to move into the future, because many of us have no choice but to take care of Medicare and Medicaid patients due to the location where we live or the communities we serve. And you can see here the major points underlined. So the costs that surgeons can control, I can control the length of stay. So there are some of us who've been sort of cavalier of length of stay and we're 2.4, 2.5, but we can rapidly move that to 1.3 just by just by keeping an overnight stay. And some of these patients can go home safely the same day. And that decreases the fixed cost that the hospital has to endure. Nursing costs for 24 hours, well, that depends on your ratio. And if your nurses are getting $130 an hour with benefits and all of the other uh, fascinating things that go into what it costs to actually employ a nurse, at 24 hours, that's over $3,000 in nursing costs. And then as the, as the ratios change from four to one to three to one, or two to one, depending on how many patients are in the hospital, those costs will go up. If you can save that, you can save over $1,000 a day just by keeping them in one less overnight. Imaging studies, do we really need upper GI studies? Maybe those even slow discharges if you're gonna keep them overnight. CT scans, what are you using to study and could these be done as an outpatient? Medication costs, lab studies, physical therapy, all of the things that we may cavalierly have in the care of our patients thinking we're giving good care, are ultimately gonna compromise that contribution margin and the total cost that the hospital has to put into caring for our patients. So operating room costs, if we look at a sleeve gastrectomy, how and what you choose affects the contribution margin and how and what you choose depends on your overall payer mix. As you mix and match these, you have to understand what the amount of money is that the hospital is working with, with each payer mix. If you're gonna choose, let's say a Titan stapler that could cost your hospital $2,000, that's going to lower the, the uh, contribution margin. And if you use it in too many cases, you'll push it negative. So in mechanical stapled cases, and we look at disposable laparoscopic, we have the choice between staplers that are powered and staplers that are mechanical. And many of us have adopted powered staplers for all our cases. But if you're in a tight margin, you may have to look at the additional costs uh, per vendor, depending on what you pick. Instruments, majority of our surgical instruments are reprocessed. And that's true to a, a certain point in robotic instruments, but those instruments have a finite lifetime. Sometimes it's 10 uses, sometimes it's 15 uses. The clip applier will use 100 clip applications. So each usage comes with an associated cost. But really, there's a, a one-time charge over the life of an instrument for these laparoscopic, unless they need to be repaired or something like that. Take Stort's needle drivers, for instance, for a, a traditional laparoscopic case, these average new about $1,200. Even if we say they're $1,500, they will last for years. And, uh, and if you don't pay attention to those costs, this email will ultimately one day come. And this was an email I received from our CFO about two weeks ago. I was presented with some rather astonishing and profoundly disappointing data about our program. He's talking about financial data. And they'd like to us convene and better understand the considerable deterior deterioration of financial performance. This isn't unique to me. This happens on the internet. I just saw this on the Robotic Surgery Coalition. It's a surgeon reaching out for help. The hospital claims we are losing money on both cases. This is a robotic program doing sleeves and ruin wise. We don't have the best payer mix here in Middle Tennessee. And is anyone else hearing gripes or complaints from the C-suite about the financial impact of their bariatric program? And the answer is yes. We are hearing those, particularly at the type of programs that this surgeon comes from in the middle of a state, we're not necessarily in a big city, we may be in an agricultural rural area and our payer mixes are significant. So some of the variable costs, the costs we can control, stapler cartridges and stapler handles. So if I look at my cheapest vendor, my, uh, my medium length laparoscopic stapling handle is $100 per handle, the long length is 115. This is comparable with vendor two, I think theirs are 135, maybe a 10 to $15 difference, certainly not gonna make or break the surgery. As we add things, the powered handle, the cost of a powered handle, and if we use a signet includes a shell, 
those have additional charges and limited usage. If we look at the adapters, they cost about 30, 20 to $30, maybe $40 a case. And if we look into which cases should we add those extra costs to, you have to take your contribution margin into account. Remember, small expenses are, are something that, that can sneak up on you. And in the end, you wonder how you ended up negative. Cartridges, vendor one, their black is 180, vendor two is 225. The purple 60 is 155 versus 162. The white is 155 versus their equivalent version is 180. So as all of these $20 here, $30 there add up, you're chewing away at your contribution margin and you need to select that appropriately and understand it in order to see how you got up to $2,000 extra a case without really trying. Well, if you look at the intuitive uh, sheet, our hospital has a price sheet and I was stunned that this went into three pages because I am far from a robotic expert. I'm still a robotic neophyte. I like working with the intuitive platform. It's, it's probably the most fantastic engineering marvel we've made in surgery, but it does come with a cost. And you heard the first speaker in, in, in Diego uh, working on how to maybe reduce the cost because it is expensive and it's not something that the hospital sees themselves as being the bank. Uh, they don't have an unlimited form of supplies. They have to actually support multiple service lines and this has to make sense to them. So if we look at some basic staplings that we use in our hospital, and these came from our price forms, we buy the Sureform 60 at a price of about $3,300. It has six uses in it, and it's about $556 a use. This is the stapler. If I wanna use a 60 and a 45, I have to actually understand that I'm gonna add another $483 per use to that case. The staplers are comparably priced, but still more expensive than our laparoscopic uh, platform. So they're 240 a stapler, all priced relatively similarly. But if I use five or six uh, stapling cartridges at 50 to $100 more, then I'm getting up into the two to $400 range plus the cost of the stapler. Now we have to look at instruments. A five millimeter curved needle driver is interesting because the Stortz needle driver costs about $1,200. This one also is about $1,200, but it only has 10 uses. So if I do 200, laparoscopic cases a, a year with my needle driver, there's very little added cost. If I do a robotic needle driver like a hernia case, I have to realize that 200 of those cases are going to result in a $30,000 increase in cost to the hospital per year to do those 200 cases. And it's similar with the wristed needle driver. It's similar with the tips up fenestrated and the cost per case may look low, but the uses of only 10 or 15 uses are what drives the cost up as we are careful with what instruments we use, but there's always gonna be two or three instruments used. So you can see it's gonna be a 400 to $600 cost plus the stapler, plus the staplers. It ends up being about $2,000 more at my institution to do these operations with the robot. And that comes directly out of the contribution margin. So you have to know how much money your hospital's gonna make and how much money they have to expend just on basic things like providing IV fluids uh, doing the anesthesia services, the operating room, and the nursing care. So location, location is absolutely the key thing. This is a nice big city in, in, in Florida. It might be Orlando. If you had one of these buildings, you might have an amazing view of the downtown. But different geographic reasons have different payer mixes. Some robotic centers have more than 25 robots. Our hospital has two. We have two hospitals. Both of them only have two. So we are certainly not a robotic center, even if we're very good at it. The robotic centers have other things that improve actual cost of doing cases, excellent turnovers, skilled robotic teams that can turn a room over in 20 minutes and have the next case going, multiple rooms so you could jump from room to room, and they have outstanding results. So the laparoscopic versus robotic outcomes are probably very similar. And they have limited and, and conservative use of disposables. Where I walked into a case at our hospital, on a laparoscopic coli, there were four open instruments on the Mayo stand and three that were being used by the surgeon. And I have no idea how much extra cost uh, chewed away at that contribution margin. So large robotic centers also can pick and choose. Some of their staff will not accept Medi-Cal or Medicaid patients. There will be limited Medicare. Uh, it's often a very high volume PPO managed hospital and they have excellent payer mix as a result of that. Now, this is where I live. I, I live in coastal California in a big agricultural area. These are the fields of strawberries. You get your strawberries from Oxnard. We also have a lot of other things growing here. And we have field workers. And most of our Medicaid plans in our area are Medicaid. 
it's very difficult to actually provide services for a community and then exclude almost 50% of the population. Our PPO plans are about 35% and the HMO plans are about 15% with Medicare and bariatric surgery making up the last about 5%. So in summary, understanding your payer mix is essential. And you really have to calculate and understand what your contribution margin is because there's a place and time to spend the extra money without hurting your hospital and providing care to your patients. Know the cost required to do each operation, the real cost. Manage costs to keep your program in the black and whenever possible, keep the contribution margin positive. This can be done with the understanding that the costs that each vendor provides, they should be open and honest. You should be able to get these costs and plan your surgery so that at the end of the year, your program is in the black and you don't get the type of letter that I got. Understanding your payer mix and the effect on contribution margin is essential. And I really recommend quarterly reviews with your hospital administration so that everybody understands what the goals of the program are with the people that you intend to serve in your community. And don't forget this, the little expenses, they actually count. We want all your ships to sail and not have any of them sink. Thank you very much. Helmet, amazing presentation, as always. So if you're going to compare apples to apples, like we talked about it, right? <clears throat> then you need to compare the cost of every single robotic platform, right? To be able to make an adjustment. Right now, we only have one robotic platform in the market in the United States. You know, other markets, as we've played around, Mojit has played with different robots too. There is all the costs, right? I can tell you this, and we had this discussion many, many times, me and you. And my reality, robotically, is very different than your reality, right? I can tell you this. For every case I do, in the average, our margin profit, 16K, okay? Profit. So, yeah, we have found different ways to cut our costs. We found different ways to, to make sense right, for the robot, for our institute to invest very, very heavily on robotic platforms, right? I think, I think when we talk about cost, you have to look at everything, man. You cannot just look the, yeah. the material alone and so forth. You have to look at everything. No, you're correct that, and that's why I brought up the big centers and focused on Orlando, because what many of these big hospitals have done is actually quite phenomenal. If you can get six cases done with the robot, but I can only get three, you're using the robot in a much more efficient manner. You have much better use of the resources, your use of the OR crews. They're not getting paid overtime because you're getting all those cases done in the time period that they're at the facility. And this is where a robot can be used outstandingly well. Now, maybe you can say you can do the same thing laparoscopically, I don't know. But if you're going to use a robot, you have to strive to accomplish what you and many other centers have accomplished, which is to identify the service line that you're gonna prioritize it with. And we all know that started with, with urology and they did exceptionally well with it. It moved on to maybe GYN, but not as well as it did with urology. And then general surgery and bariatrics, there are some key centers which have exploded. I, I envy watching some of, my, some of my colleagues that can do a SADI and they can do it in an hour and five minutes elegantly with the robot and then move immediately into another robot room. This also takes your assistance into account where you have the PA that can finish the case and maybe another assistant that can start you with the next one. But efficiency, I think, is the key to the robot. Me with only two, I can only dabble with the robot. And, and that's because I only have two to choose from. And it's, it's really in popular demand. So I have to look at the cost. If I jump into it without the cost, I can accidentally hurt myself. So it's more my center. to Florida. Oh, I know I need to. It's uh, right now it's raining and snowing and everything better in Florida. Yeah, um, I was just going to give a shout out. You know, Helmut, that was a great talk. And I just wanted to mention that Helmut and I have an abstract that we're going to present at Sages that looks at cost in hybrid stapling versus just pure robotic stapling. So I, I can't give too much away. I guess it's embargoed until Sages, but look for us. We have a podium presentation that Helmut will be, uh, will be talking about. But, but I think it's a, very important to control cost and to think about cost. And sometimes you see things on these social media platforms where people are like, well, I don't pay for it. What does that have to do with anything? Ah, it's got a lot to do with it. it, we it, can't, to do with it. Because if, if you're not if you're not at the table, you're on the table. And 
And when somebody decides that service line is gone, look at the pandemic. All those employed uh, plastic surgeons, they were just sent home without pay where because there was no need for it, whereas general surgeons still had something to fall back on. So we do have to consider it. So we, we do have that abstract. I hope you guys can come by and see that when we're, when we're in Cleveland. Great talk. That was awesome. Mohit, well, you have a question? Yeah. You know, I think uh, we are in a very special situation. So the cost of uh, uh, laparoscopic surgery in U.S., uh, one-tenth is the cost of uh, laparoscopic surgery in India. So, you know, the cost dynamics are so different in different countries. Um, it's different in different parts of U.S. Like we have 10 robotic companies in India already. Uh, now, in IRCAD India, we are approached by six companies to put robots free of cost. So it's intuitive, it's CMR, it's microtech. Uh, it's, it's, there's a new Indian company um, known as uh, SSR. So we have mm -hmm. so many companies and the cost is through away in India. I mean, I can even offer a free robotic surgery to somebody because there's so much of R&D, there is so much of material for clinical trials, so much of instrumentation given free of cost. Uh, it, I think it, it's different for different ethnicities and countries uh, where the companies or the institutes would sponsor it. So we cannot generalize. Like for you uh, in Orlando, it's different. I absolutely can understand situation of Filmat where he's totally different. Just with two robots, he can't expect and he should not be doing too much of robotics. That, that doesn't make sense to him. So I think um, we are still not there with the technology where... We are in, at a stage of democratizing robotic surgery. We are way, way away from that, at least in US, what I can see, because of the regulatory processes and the additional cost you guys have. Well, you know, it, to, to point, Andre, you, uh, you touched upon, we have only really one robot on the market right now in our mm -hmm. hospital. I just came from the Disruptive Technology Summit, and the number of robotic innovations that are coming out are quite mind-boggling. I, I once made the comment that I don't need a space shuttle. I need a fancy crop duster out where I live. And, and sure enough, there's companies. I said I needed a, a camera holder that I could talk to and it would move. And I need another robotic arm to hold the gallbladder so I can do these alone. I, I fully believe all of those are coming. And, and we'll say, Andre, using you know the fantastic Maserati of robots, and you'll see me out here you know, using the less complex, less simplified, but still robotic technology. And I think it was all pioneered with robot robotic platforms, but, you know, the, the, the cost is still significant for some of our smaller programs. Well, Helmut, listen, you know, a, fr a good friend of mine, that a lot of you know him, once told me, he said, listen, you don't have to be bad, you just have to be good, be good enough, right? A lot of those platforms, are they going to surpass intuitive? Probably not, right? Because you're so far ahead, right? But for some institution, they just need something that's going to be good enough, right? Which also brings competition. I mean, competition is great, right? The more you have, more competition you're going to have, and price activities are going to drop. So to me, I'm all, I can't wait for to see the amount of robots that, that was shown at the conference. Because I think it's going to open up a lot of different things, you know. Any other questions for Dr. Billy? All right. I know we have passed our time. I just want to say thank you, everyone, to participate in this meeting. Thank you, Gina. Thank you, Medtronic. Thank you, um, Diego, Helmet, Mohit, um, Bank Lab, Dr. Eman, um, Johnson. And he left. Santi always leaves, just like a true Argentinian, just leaves without saying goodbye. So anyway, thank you everyone for participating and you guys are amazing. Um, you know, this is just the beginning. I think the, it's always good to stir the pot and spice things up with uh, debates. I love this kind of stuff. Anyway, thank you very much for your time.